Today, on Connection Point Education. So God had commanded Moses to take this impossible route to show the Egyptians and the Hebrews once more that he was God and he wanted to reveal his great power. And they were about to see that and didn't even know it. Feeding the Sheep for God's Glory. Connection Point Studio Productions. From Connection Point Church. The Open Class Bible Study. This is Connection Point Education a Bible Truth Ministry. I moved to, as, we, as I was preparing the study, to recognize that when spiritual awakening happens in America, there is also a darkness that comes against it. Because you don't think, don't think that the devil isn't going to try to do something to defeat that. And so there are going to be obstacles along the way. When I got saved in that Jesus movement back in 1970, when I got saved, it was, it was amazing to see how God was moving and, and lives were being changed. But there were a lot of obstacles away. I was a brand new Christian, brand new Christian. I knew something about the faith. I'd grown up in the church. But this new relationship that I had was, was, um, was exciting. But at the same time, it was one of those things where I recognized that I was in a spiritual battle and didn't even understand understand it. And we're going to come into this spiritual battle in our lives. And there are going to be conflicts and obje- uh, 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 obstacles and dead ends in our lives that we're just not going to know what to do. Connection well, this passage today tells us what to do. It shows us what to do when conflict and obstacles come and we, there's nowhere to turn. How do we deal with those things? Let's look at our passage. And uh, we're in Exodus chapter 14, starting with verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pahirath, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They're wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, what is this we've done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots, 600 chosen chariots. And took his army with him and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. So there were maybe well over a thousand chariots of people. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and encamped at the sea by Pahiharoth in front of Baal Zephon. Now, I want you to see something that at the end of verse 8, it said uh, that Pharaoh and the army pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. They were on their way going, wow, we did it. We're free. 420 years and, and we're set free. And oh man, God's awesome. God is so good. Look what he's done. And we're moving on. Two million people crossing the desert, going to a promised land that God's promised them. And they were defiant. This is, this is what God is doing. Look what God is doing. This is so exciting. And we're part of it. And then all of a sudden, something went wrong. It happens in life, doesn't it? And I want you to see, I want you to sort of visualize what happens with, uh, with uh, the Hebrews here. Let's look at this map. They had been traveling, 
And uh, they had traveled from, from, uh, from the north area of Egypt, from this area, from Goshen. And they came down this path right here, and they end up uh, down at uh, Sukkot and Etham, right around in this area here. I think this path is wrong, to be honest with you. I think they actually came down this way. And that, that little area there is called the Great uh, Bitter Lake. This one is called the Little Bitter Lake. And right here in this area, it's small, you can't really see it there, but that's the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, as they call it. But uh, this seems to be the way that they actually travel. They came down this way, crossed somewhere around here, and then came on down through here and followed that path. Now, way before the Gulf of Suez uh, added the Suez Canal, the Gulf of Suez, as you can see it here, obviously just here, stops around here. Well, there are all kinds of little lakes and water bodies of water. Now, that is one canal that goes all the way through there now. But before, it wasn't that way. There were all these bodies of water that were, that were sort of connected through that. And so, uh, that was what was, that was, the way, that was the terrain of the area. And we don't know the exact route that they were taking. Um, in fact, they probably didn't know either. Uh, but we're given a few clues by, by basically told certain markers and, and topography of what was going on. And this area that's described in verse 2 seems to match up with this area, which is north of the Gulf of Suez near the Bitter Lakes, with this area right in here. That's, that what it, is what it seems to match up with. And I think the route that's indicated here, uh, it makes more sense that it's, that it's in this area that is to the west of those lakes, as I, as I mentioned. And they camp toward this southern end. And in... Um, that's probably where they crossed. Now, as I mentioned before, there was the Great Bitter Lake and then the smaller Bitter Lake. And then right as part of that is what was the Reed Sea, which was really basically just a big, giant, marshy, swamp-type area. So I think they actually crossed. They could have either crossed the Bitter Lake right here, the Great Bitter Lake, or this particularly, which is called the smaller or the small bitter lake. It, it, now it's a huge body of water. It doesn't look that big on the map, but it is a very large body of water. And so uh, that's, I'm just guessing that that's where they cross. It's just speculation on my part, and we won't really know until some archaeology expedition reveals the exact location, or if we get to heaven, then we'll know. But uh, in any case, it was a difficult place for them to be caught by this oncoming Egyptian army from the north, because at that particular point, at that particular place, they were trapped between a body of water, a very rocky mountainous range, which was on right at this body of water, this whole area is just this, it's just a rocky, it's real craggy, mountainous range. And then south of them was just the desert, a rocky desert. Uh, you can see a little bit of the topography there. So they were trapped. There was nowhere to go. They were up against the water and coming from the north was this, this huge army that was coming for them. And it was, it was, it was frightening. And it was just like they had been, as the scripture says, they had been defiant. And now all of a sudden, ooh, now what? So let's look at what, to, what happens when trouble comes. Because on your journey to freedom, from the bondages of your life, just like they were on a journey of freedom from the bondage of slavery. When you're on your journey to freedom from the bondages in your life, you're going to encounter challenges and obstacles and overwhelming conflicts and seeming defeat. It's going to happen that way. And if there is a spiritual awakening coming to America, we're going to see that. We're going to see challenges and obstacles and overwhelming conflicts and seeming defeat. But God is in control. Spiritual awakening comes from God. You don't think that God's going to offer spiritual awakening if it isn't going to succeed, do you? That is, this is exactly what happened with the Hebrews during the Exodus. And every one of those trials that they went through, and we're going to see a lot of them as they travel through the desert and all, we're going to see a lot of, a lot of these trials. Every one of those trials was an opportunity to see God work. To see God solve the impossible. To see God overcome the probabilities and reveal the possibilities. And that's where we need to live. Discovering that we are to live in the possibilities of God. Not the, pro oops, not the probabilities of the circumstances in which we live. This is the first major trial after the Jews had set out from their journey. And it's a perfect example uh, and we can see ourselves in the way that they responded to the conflict. 
I want you to see this in the scripture, the passage of scriptures in your study guides there. But in Exodus chapter 14, starting with verse 10, and when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. Now, just in verse 8, they had been defiant. Two verses later, now they fear greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Boy, things sure did change fast when the conflict came. Now I want you to look at four ways that we normally deal with conflict in our lives. These are in this passage of Scripture. The first one is in verse 10, and it's fear. In verse 10, the people feared greatly. Now think about this. The Egyptian army, this is really important to understand, the Egyptian army wasn't out to destroy the Jews. They weren't going out there to kill the Jews. They were going out to re-enslave them. Do you remember that in the passage in verse 5? We looked at this. The, 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 the Egyptians said to themselves, what is this that we've done that we have let Israel go from serving us? What they wanted to do was go re-enslave them, take them back and put them back into slavery. Egypt's economy had tanked because some 2 million Jews had left. Then They didn't have anybody to do the slave labor anymore. But the Hebrews didn't see it that way. They just assumed that they were about to be massacred. That's what they saw happen. They said, Moses, you brought us out here to die. When in fact, Egypt just wanted to re-enslave them. Now, that leads to the second thing that happens when we're dealing with conflict, and that's desperation. It's in verse 10. The Bible says that they feared greatly, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Well, that's the first thing you would do, isn't it? When you're facing a conflict, you begin crying out to the Lord. We often do the same thing, and why shouldn't we? We're caught in a, a desperate situation. No, no, sensible, no sensible way to go. Nowhere is there anything that looks like this is the right thing to do. We may feel like we've been deceived, as we'll see that the Hebrews felt, and we start, this is what we start doing in desperation. We start panic praying. Man, I'm good at that. You know, we're good at panic praying. And we come flying through the bedroom door and we hit the floor on our knees and slide 10 feet to the side of the bed crying out, Oh God, we have a huge problem. And God says, what do you mean, we? The interesting thing is that we are the ones that have the problem. This situation is not a problem for God and he's not panicking. And I want to tell you something, as the Israelites, or the, the, the Hebrews, the, the, I say Hebrews because they hadn't received the name Israelites yet, the, the, the name Israel as a people, the Hebrews, they were, they were panicking, and they were in a desperate situation, and they cried out to God, and God, you've got to do something for us, but God was not panicking. In fact, just the opposite and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But what happens when we get into that desperation? We start, first of all, we just start fear. Fear begins to dominate our lives. <clears throat> and then we get desperate. And then we start getting into blame. Moses was an immediate target for these panicked Hebrews. In fact, you have to read when they said, is it because there are no graves in Egypt? You have to read that in the most sarcastic tone possible. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt? Why do you have to read it that way? Because death was a sacred element to the Egyptian culture. And they spent a great deal of time and effort to honor the dead. Think of the pyramids. In fact, death was considered a greater state of being than life on earth to the, to the Egyptians. They honored death. To them, death was a noble thing that's happened. You've lived your life on earth. Now you're living the afterlife. Now you're living above life on earth. It was a greater state of life than here on earth. And so graves were the passage to the afterlife. And they were highly revered. 
As we've studied Egyptian graves from the past, we've noticed that they did some amazing things. They put stuff in there, you know, to take this with you to the afterlife, like you could take it with you. But, uh, it, it, and by the way, if, if anything proves that you can't take it with you, the pyramids do. Because they're full of stuff. You know, uh, but they, they honor these people who died because they were moving on. And Egypt specialized in graves. And get this, Egypt had, had dedicated about three-fourths of its land for grave sites. Now, Egypt, look at, oh, we don't have the map up. But look, look at the map of Egypt. It was a huge area. And about three-fourths of that was dedicated to graves and grave sites. Imagine what would happen if three-fourths of America was dedicated to graves and grave sites. But that's the way it was. They honored death. They revered death. And, and so graves and grave sites were in abundance in Egypt. And thus, the cynicism and the sarcasm of verse 11. So, did we not have enough graves in Egypt? Is that why you brought us out here to die? See the cynicism there and the sarcasm? What they were doing was they were blaming Moses. Moses, you didn't think this through. Moses, this is your fault. I'm really good at blaming other people, by the way. I am, I, I, sometime, sometime I'll do a seminar on how to blame other people. Because, man, I'm good at it. And that brings us to the fourth thing that we tend to do when we face a conflict in our life, and that is compromise. It's in verse 12, compromise. The Hebrews began immediately, they began playing the we told you so card. We told you so. We told you so, Moses. We told you so. Think about this. The Hebrews had just finished going through the 10 plagues of Egypt where they saw the obvious hand of God at work. Ten plagues where it was very clear that God was up to something. And now, when a seemingly unsolvable problem comes up, they quit thinking about the possibilities of what God was up to, and they started thinking about the probabilities. And the probabilities was, as they stated in a very cynical, false reality, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. That's compromise. And we begin to compromise when we're faced with conflict. We begin looking at, at the issues and we think, okay, uh, maybe, maybe we should just try doing this. I hope we could do this, but maybe we'll just do it this way. And we begin to compromise. They encountered their first significant conflict in their flight to freedom. And immediately they were ready to compromise. Their reality was impending failure, loss, and defeat. And they were ready to give up. But I want you to look at the real reality of it. Pharaoh had assumed that Israel's divine help had run out. It's an interesting perspective because the Egyptian gods had been so useless during the plagues. Remember that? Every one of the plagues attacked some of the gods of Egypt. And those gods were helpless because they weren't gods. They were statues or drawings. They were worthless in, the, in those situations. And so Pharaoh it would be natural for Th Pharaoh to assume that, well, the Israel's gods must be like our gods, can't do anything. And so maybe it's, well, it's clear that he thought that the Hebrews' God had run out of power and that the Hebrews were hopelessly entangled on this dead-end trail since the craggy mountains and the desert and the sea and the marshes barred their way out of this trap. They were trapped. Pharaoh knew he had them. God, however, let me say it a different way, but God had commanded Moses to take this impossible route. Remember, as we studied last Sunday, they could have taken the route through the north and gone an easier route. There's actually a road that way. They could have taken that route, but they would have had to battle uh, some of the, the, the tribes along the way. And they weren't ready for that. And God knew that. And he wanted to protect them from that. This was the way to go. And so he commands Moses. Remember, they're being led by this big giant cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. God's presence was very real. And think about this. Where they were stuck, they were in God's presence. God had led them there. They didn't see it that way. They saw that maybe Moses had brought them there to be killed. They were trapped. And sometimes in our life, in conflicts come in our life, we think, well, I thought I was doing the right thing, but obviously I wasn't, and now I'm trapped. 
I can't tell you how many times that's happened in my life. It happened when we moved up here and I lost my job and I couldn't find a job anywhere. I couldn't find a job anywhere and I, couldn't, I didn't have the money to pay all of our bills. We had three little boys. Three little boys eat like three grown men. And it was, it was a difficult, we couldn't even pay our rent. It was, and then we had car trouble and then we lost our house in Florida. God, what are you doing? Why did you bring me here to die? It was like God's fault. And yet I was following what I thought was following God. And then I began to question that. And I can look back on it now and tell you I was following God. And God's presence was real. I just didn't see it sometimes during that time. So God had commanded Moses to take this impossible route to show the Egyptians and the Hebrews once more that he was God and he wanted to reveal his great power. And they were about to see that and didn't even know it. So I want us to look at five things that God wants us to do to handle conflict in our life. When things are going wrong, when life is falling apart, what are five things that you can do to handle conflict? It's also in this passage, and the first thing is found in verses 13, well, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Notice he said, he will work for you today. I'm not going to do it. Moses said, I'm not doing this. You can blame me, but it's not up to me. It's up to God. Stand firm and see what God's going to do today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Now let's look at these five things that God wants us to do to handle conflict. Number one is in verse 13, fear not. This is an interesting principle. It's actually a command. Fear not is the number one command in the Bible. Did you know that? Numerically speaking. Fear not or do not be afraid is in the Bible 66 times, far more than any other command in the Bible. Now, if it's in there that many times, then there's something that we should take, take heed of. Why does God tell us not to be afraid? Because when you are afraid, when you have an unhealthy fear, now, if you're being attacked by a dog and you're afraid of the dog, that's a healthy fear. But when you have an unhealthy fear where you're, you're not seeing the reality of what's going on, you may think you are, but it's an unhealthy fear, and an unhealthy fear makes you make bad choices. And the Hebrews' fear, as we've already seen, led them to want to compromise, to give up the very thing that the Egyptian army could have hoped for. They wanted them to give up so they could enslave them again. They weren't out to kill them. They were there to take them back to Egypt to start building more bricks. Remember, as I said, the Egyptian army just wanted to enslave them. Generally, the conflicts in your life are not about killing you. They're about enslaving you, putting you into bondage, or perhaps putting you back into bondage. So one of the first things that you need to do is think about what kind of bondage is this conflict trying to inflict on my life? When you're facing a conflict in your life, the very first questions you need to ask is, what kind of bondage is this trying to put me in? Is it a bondage? Is it financial bondage? Is it a bondage of abuse? Is it the bondage of loss or the, the bondage of failure? What kind of bondage are you facing? Listen, when God called Jeremiah to his ministry, Jeremiah was fearful. It's, it's, it's amazing to compare what Jeremiah said to what Moses said, as we studied some time ago. But it's in Jeremiah chapter 1, the beginning of the book of Jeremiah. Then Jeremiah is speaking, and he says, Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. You see, what he was saying was, Jeremiah, when you are afraid, when you think that you're not qualified to do something and you're afraid to try it, then you become, bond, you become in bond, enslaved to that. 
You see what happens when God tells you to do something, you say, oh, I can't do that. I, I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm not able. I'm not qualified to do that. You become, a, you become a servant to that. You become enslaved by that because now it has control over your life instead of letting God have the control over your life. And so God was saying to him, look, I, 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 I want you to know that I'm here. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to speak for you. Don't be afraid of them because I'm going to deliver you. You're going to be free. I'm going to set you free. Don't be afraid of the bondage. Be afraid of the disobedience. Don't be afraid of the bondage. Be afraid of the disobedience. Don't be afraid of the bondage. Be afraid of the disobedience. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? They're a little bit more now with inflation. (laughs) And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered, for most of you. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. You know, I, I, I like to feed birds. I don't know how I picked. I think I picked up the habit from my brother-in-law and, and my sister. It's something that they do. They live out in the country, and they have bird feeders. And I just thought it was kind of cool what they did. So I came home, bought some bird feeders, put one out on the tree in front, have one in the back of the house. And I'm telling you right now, birds are nothing more than pigs with wings. <laughs> they will clean your pocket. And uh, just buying bird seed, you know. And, uh, and you have to buy the right bird seed because if you buy the wrong bird seed, as, because birds only eat about half of what they put in their mouth, they spit the rest of it out. And when they spit it out, if it's another seed, it starts growing in the ground. Before you know it, you've got sunflowers growing up and weeds growing up. And, you know, it's just, so you have to do the crack shell. I know all about this. I am a bird expert now. But one of the things that I love to do is to sit in the, in the room, in our front room, look out the window in, in the morning, sometimes have coffee, sometimes I go to the, the back window, sit there, and I watch what the birds do. And I see these birds, and I see these sparrows, and the chickadees, and the, and, and the wrens, and, 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 and the, the finches, and the darlings. I do see cardinals, and I do see blue jays, and I see blue birds. I, you know, I've got them, man, I've got them figured out. But I always think about this passage when God said, is one of them forgotten before God? And I was saying, God, what's, what's that bird's name? God, how did, how did that bird come to be? God, you, you know all about that bird. You've not forgotten that one bird. And one day I have a little It's like chicken wire around my bird feeder so that the big birds, and I'm talking about starlings and crows and stuff, don't get into it. And uh, one of the little birds got caught uh, in the wiring because another bird was attacking it. That's another thing about birds. They're very territorial. And uh, they uh, and this bird had gotten its wing caught in it, and I thought, well, I'm going to go out there to help it because, oh no, this little bird's caught in that trap, you know. And I went out there to help it, and the bird said, oh no, fat boy's coming, I got to get out of here. And he worked himself out loose and took off, you know. <laughs> but I thought to myself, God, did you see that? Did you see that fright or flight? You know, it was one of those things. And, 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 I, and I thought, God knew what was happening with that little bird. He knew. Not one of them is forgotten. Now, if God watches over the sparrows, the little bitty sparrows, the little bitty pigs with wings, if God watches over them, fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. God has value on your life. Think about this. Fear, oh man, this is so important to get. Fear can be the beginning of God's peace. Taking notes? Write that down. Fear can be the beginning of God's peace. Why do I say that? Because instead of letting your fear lead you to bad choices, if you handle your fear the right way, it can lead you into God's will and God's peace. So fear, when you are afraid, if you handle it the right way, it can lead you into God's peace. 
So what kind of bondage is your conflict trying to inflict in your life? You look at it, and there's fear in your life. But think about it. Take a step back and say, what kind of bondage is this issue, this matter, trying to enslave me with? How am I going to be enslaved by this issue? What is the problem? What is the real problem here? What is the bondage going to be here? Because once you figure that out, and you know that God doesn't want you in bondage, you can move on to the next step, which is in verse 13, stand firm. When you know that God doesn't want you in bondage, and you know what that bondage could be, now you can stand firm. Now listen to this. Here's another one to write down. Standing firm is the posture of freedom. Standing firm is the posture of freedom. Galatians 5.1 says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Bondage. Stand firm. That's how you stay out of bondage. Stand firm. And I know you know this, but we can always use another reminder. How do you stand firm? Ephesians 6, starting with verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Now, here's how you do it. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, doing the right thing because you're right with God. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Know the gospel of peace. In other words, study the gospel of peace. How can you have peace from the word of God? In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. Faith, trusting obedience to the known will of God. That's faith. So in all circumstances, take up the shield of trusting obedience to the known will of God. Don't worry about what you don't know. God will make sure that you know what you need to know. Take take focus or, or take care about what you do know. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The one who's coming to enslave you. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. Make your supplications known to God. Ask God. Tell Him what your needs are as you understand them. Ask Him what your needs are. Understand that He taught you to pray, give us this day our daily bread. What did Jesus mean by that? He said, Lord, meet our needs for today. Meet my needs for today, God. So praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Pray for each other. My biggest pain in my heart about you people is that some of you don't have anybody to pray for you. Connection point education. Particularly single people. You may not have a family that prays for you. Some of you may have a spouse who doesn't pray for you. And I have, a, I have a burden about that. And there are some of you that I know are single, and I know most likely nobody's praying for you. I pray for you. I want you to know that as God lays you on my heart, I pray for you. Because I really believe that we are to make supplication for all the saints. And I know that God has motivated me to pray for some people that don't have somebody praying for them. Now, I pray every day for my wife because she needs praying for And I pray every day for my children. And I pray every day for my grandchildren. And I pray for my nation. And I pray for my church. And I pray for the open class. And when I pray for the open class, sometimes God puts you on my heart. And then sometimes God puts you on my heart, even though I know there are people praying for you. Because maybe you need a little extra. We are to pray, make supplication for all the saints. 
And what should we do then while we're standing firm? Well, we put this Ephesians, this armor of God thing into place. Now, what should we do? Well, we're all ready. We've got the armor of God all on us. We're, we've got the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of, of, of the readiness of gospel of peace and the, the shield of faith and, and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We got all of that going for us. What are we supposed to do at that point? It's in verse 13. Watch God work. Isn't that amazing? I'm ready to go into battle. I got the armor of God on. Boy, I'm ready to go whack some heads. And God says, hold off, big boy. Sit down, Sparky. I want you to watch what I am going to do. This third principle can be so exciting and yet so unnerving at the same time. God just never seems to work fast enough, does he? I mean, God doesn't have a watch. God has a calendar. Hey, God, what time are you going to be here? Well, let's see. Today is February. The, uh, I'm thinking maybe June. June! I'm up against the wall here. The Egyptians are moving in on me. i got to do something. God just doesn't ever seem to move fast enough, does he? And one of the mistakes that we make is we think that we have to help him out. My dad used to tell the story about the little girl who uh, was sad because her little brother had gone next door to play with a neighbor, and she was left all alone, and she had nobody to play for her. So she prayed, and she asked God to send her brother home so she could play, play with him. And after a few minutes of waiting, she marched herself over to the neighbor's house and grabbed her brother by the arm and started dragging him home. And his, their mother, uh, who was inside the house, heard the commotion. She goes out to see what's going on. She runs out in the yard. She says to the little girl, what are you doing? And the little girl answered, I'm helping God answer my prayer. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. We think that we need to help God answer our prayer, don't we? The only help God needs when it comes to answering your prayer is for you to stand firm and watch God work. Write it down. Watch God work. The problem with that is that God usually doesn't work the way that we think he should. And so sometimes we think, well, this is what God needs to do, and he's at work, and we're saying, where's God? I'm supposed to watch God work, and I don't see anything happening. How come God's not doing something? I can guarantee you that it never crossed one of those Hebrews' minds that God was going to split the sea so that they could cross over to a new freedom. It never, I guarantee you, it never crossed their minds. What are we going to do? Well, you know, maybe we could just, you know, split the sea and walk across on dry land. Maybe, maybe they didn't think that. And you wouldn't have thought that way either. And so they didn't think that God was going to split the sea, let them cross over to a new freedom. And by the way, this time, this walk to freedom, meant that they would be free from the Egyptians forever. They never had to deal with Egypt again after this. Never. But you see, God specializes in possibilities. They never thought that this could be a possibility, but God specializes in possibilities. God loves impossibilities. Why? Because God, Jesus made it very clear, Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible. The mess in your life right now, God doesn't look at it as, as an impossible issue. God says, with God, all things are possible. That's what Jesus said. And either Jesus was a liar or you're a liar because you believe God can't do anything or that God's not going to do something. So that takes us to the fourth principle of how to handle conflict. Verse 14, let God fight for you. Let God fight for you. When David, as a young boy, confronted Goliath, who was a trained, very successful warrior who was out to destroy the Israelites, David went with a very simple faith. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
starting with verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This is a boy speaking to a giant. And I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. And then, look what happened. 1 Samuel 17, 49. And David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and slung it. I love that. He slung it, and he struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank him to his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So how is this the battle of the Lord's if it was David who slung the stone? I mean, either that stone was thrown with an amazing force, or that guy was a mushhead. So how, do, how is this battle the Lord's? Well, think about it. Is it even possible that a boy could exercise so much speed and force and precision to nail a Goliath right in the forehead and defeat him with one stone? Is that, is that even possible? The battle was the Lord's. The willingness and obedience was David's. There you go. Hello. The battle is the Lord's. The willingness and the obedience is yours. The battle is the Lord's. The willingness and obedience is yours. What God told the Hebrews through Moses was that the battle is the Lord's, and so is the victory. The battle is the Lord's, and so is the victory. It's not your victory. When the solution comes to the conflict, it's not your victory. It's God's victory. You just get to get in on it. But there has to be obedience on your part to do what God tells you and leads you to do without mouthing off to God. Hello. Because you're good at it. I've seen how some of you mouth off to me. And I'm me. You can imagine what you do to God. Listen, you are to let God fight for you without mouthing off at God, which brings us to the last principle of how to handle conflict, and that's verse 14. Shut up. Oh, I'm sorry. The Bible says, be silent. Be silent. Now, I want you to learn something about this principle of being silent. It's a principle that's taught in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. I've got, I actually have 10 minutes left, but I'm not going to take that much time. You'll be happy to know. Here it is. I want you to understand this principle, and I call it the divine doctrine of stillness. The divine doctrine of stillness. I want you to know that's copyrighted, so don't try to take credit for it. I say that because I know that Rick Stengel listens and he takes my notes and teaches them as his own. (laughs) Kidding, Rick. Just kidding. No, I'm not. (laughs) Love that man. In the Hebrew, the word for still, get this, in the Hebrew, the word for still means quiet or undisturbed. Be quiet, be still, be undisturbed. Wait, how did we get from a conflict where we were fearful to this conflict where we're quiet, where we're still? Psalm 65, 5 and 8 says this, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy." 
God, I'm in this situation right now where I am backed up against a sea. I got rocks to the left of me and that I can't climb. I got a desert to the right of me that I, I don't know what to do about. I can't go that way. And now I got this Egyptian army, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chariots coming at me. And you want me to be still? Yes. Psalm 37, verses 7 9. Psalm 37, one of my favorite psalms of all time. Be still before the Lord. Remember, the word still means quiet or undisturbed. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Whoa! Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Quit getting all worked up over something. It just leads to evil. And as I recall, if you were praying the Lord's Prayer, you said, deliver me from evil. Well, how are you going to deliver, be delivered from evil if you choose to fret over things? If you choose to worry over life and situations in your life, it only leads to evil. Verse 9 says, for the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. By the way, inherit the land means that you'll live in success. You'll live in, the Bible's word for it is shalom. We say that means peace, but it means more than peace. It means success. And then Psalm 46.10, and you know this verse, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. Not you. You're not God. And so that means that you're not in control. And if you're not in control, then what in the world are you doing running your own life? Be still and know that I am God. In the Greek, the word for still means to be reduced to silent. In the Old Testament, it means quiet or undisturbed. In the New Testament, it means to be reduced to silence. And Jesus taught that principle in a magnificent way. The disciples and Jesus were in a boat out on the Sea of Galilee. You know the story. And this horrifying storm broke out. Mark 4 talks about it. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? By the way, I want to point something out. Because Jesus was in the stern, he was taking the brunt of the storm. Because you see, when you're in a boat, you face the storm with your boat. And so Jesus was in the stern, and it was taking the brunt of the, of the battle, of the, of, the, of the storm. He was in the stern, and he was asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke, and he didn't rebuke them. He didn't get on to them and say, oh, you of little faith. Why don't you guys form a prayer committee and bring this up, you know? No. He awoke and he rebuked the wind. And he said to the sea, peace, be still. Now remember the word still in the New Testament means to be reduced to silence. So Jesus said to the wind and to the storm, peace, be reduced to silence. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Now listen to this. If God can command a brutal storm and a raging sea to be still, and the storm and the sea immediately become calm, he can certainly do that in your life. But it begins with you obeying his command to be still. You're not going to find peace in your life. You're not going to find victory over the conflict. You're not going to find peace in the conflict until you be still. 
God wants to calm the storm, but your responsibility is to be reduced to silence and wait on God. Which brings us to this final point. We close with the last few verses of Exodus 14 there. God makes a way. God makes a way. Verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. God said, you know what? I'm going to open up the sea. Don't worry about it. It'll be ready for you in the morning when you wake up. Could you sleep when you're under conflict like that? God says, oh, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it overnight. You'll be, in the morning, you'll be able to walk you know, across the sea, through the sea and dry land. What? You're, 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 and now I'm supposed to sleep? And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. The waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Verse 30 then says, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord. Oh, and in his servant Moses. Are you dealing with some critical situations in your life? Are you dealing with some critical situations in your life, some conflict? Does it seem as if you're backed into a corner and there's nowhere to go? Does it look like the enemy is closing in on you and you're stuck? Let me encourage you to fear not. Stand firm. Watch God work for you. Let God fight for you and be still. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we'd like to thank you for watching. We hope it's a blessing. 